we are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast i'm your host eric lambert and today i have a guest named henry doktorski he is an author who's written prolifically on a topic that we're going to be discussing that i've never talked about here on myth vision and that is the is it harry krishna cult correct and so you're going to be filling us in you've written many books eight in fact i believe you said maybe more actually um gold guns and god and of course killing for krishna and then 11 is it the 11 naked emperors we're going to be diving deep into some of this cult and the background behind it what happened what makes this such a crazy uh, story in fact we're going to get into some of the details i suspect but welcome to myth vision and uh if you don't mind introduce yourself hi hey thanks thanks for having me derek um uh, I am a former Hare Krishna devotee. Uh, I, I lived at the uh, New Vrindavan, West Virginia, Hare Krishna community for about 15, 16 years from 1978. As soon as I finished college, I actually got my undergraduate degree. And uh, yeah, I had a great time mostly, uh, but I left in 93, 94 because, uh, uh, boy, it was getting really weird. And I had my ideas have changed also since then you know so so now uh it, it's uh for me it's uh uh writing writing about those times and documenting the history uh so that uh many people could learn from my experiences and the experience of others and hopefully benefit from that what if you don't mind taking us back i must admit my ignorance. I have not read your works. I was informed by a patron member who told me you must interview Henry. And I said, okay, I will. But I, I've heard the name in passing Harry Krishna. And all I know is the word Krishna is a Hindu God. And that's the only thing I'm aware of is that Krishna is a Hindu God and it's a Hindu term, or at least from India. Can you tell us who this cult leader is what fascinated you what drew you into the community to begin with were there certain teachings or ideas um that made you convinced to go well uh yeah in college i became interested in uh indian thought and and philosophy i had uh heard about the maharishi uh, mahash yogi transcendental meditation and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I paid my thirty-five dollars uh, initiation fee, and I got my secret mantra, which I used to uh, chant in in my mind twenty minutes in the morning and in the evening. and And I thought that was cool. I, I liked. I think meditation's a really good thing. And uh, after college, I happened to visit the uh, the New Vrindavan West Virginia Hare Krishna community. It's it, at the time it was a farm community. Pretty, uh, the motto was simple living, high thinking. And I visited uh, visited for an afternoon, and I met a lot. I met some of the devotees and ate some of the the vegetarian food. And I thought, I thought, I thought it was really a, a great place. I said, these people practice what they preach. They, they the, the Hindus uh, for the most part, and the Krishnas, they, they believe in reincarnation. Uh, in other words, that you know you you don't suffer in hell eternally if mm -hmm. you know you don't follow. And I thought reincarnation is pretty cool because everybody gets a second chance, and they're vegetarians. And and I was leaning that way. I thought, well, that's kind of nonviolent. You know, I think nonviolence is a good thing. Why eat animals if if you don't have to? Mm -hmm. And uh, and they you know Krishna uh, 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 of course is the uh, they they call it the supreme personality of Godhead because there's so many gods in uh, in Hinduism but Krishna uh, according you know to their scriptures is the source of all the other gods so you might if you're gonna if you're gonna worship and serve and pray to uh, a, a, a deity. You might as well go right to the top, the the top guy, top dude, you know, like mm -hmm. that. Of course, they didn't say dude. I'm just, <laughs> I've become quite irreverent, uh, I suppose, in my old age. But, but uh, yeah. So, uh, 
it was, uh, you know, I was impressed. I, I thought these are like the green berets of the spiritual movements. I had visited Maharishi's university in Iowa earlier, and I wasn't impressed because because the, the, the male students, they wore uh, uh, suits and ties. And at the time, I would never was a hippie, but I kind of identified with them. And I had long hair and, you know, wore jeans and stuff like that. And, but the, the, the New Vrindavan people, the men shaved their heads and uh, they were vegetarians. The, the single men, they lived in an ashram uh, in sleeping bags on the floor. Very simple. And uh, I, I, I appreciated that. I, I, it was austere. It wasn't plush. And I thought, well, if you're going to be a, a monk, you, you, uh, you, you have to adopt some, some uh, austerities, some hardships like that. And, and I had a great time there for you know, almost 15, 16 years. Wow. So you, were in, you did what they did? You, you practiced like they did? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, see, see for, if in my case... Uh, see, I had just uh, got my undergraduate degree in music. Uh, I was a piano performance and a uh, double major in uh, music education. And I was actually on my way to graduate school in North Texas State to study piano. And, uh, but, but at that time of my life, there was a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. A lot of insecurities in in me. Uh, I had some, you know, wonderful uh, experiences with with women in college, but I also had some very devastating experiences. And uh, and I and I saw that the the men were celibate at the New Vrindavan community. I thought, well, you know, if I can't have a a really great relationship with a woman, might as well give up the whole thing like that right. you know, and, and just be, become like this Brahmin. They call him Brahmachari. It's a, a, a celibate monk in the, the, uh, the Hindu, Hindu term. But so my life was kind of uncertain. And uh, I visit, uh, this, my second visit, I met Kirtanananda Swami. He was the, the leader of the community. Uh, he was one of the first disciples of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Now, that's a mouthful. But, mm -hmm. uh, but the Prabhupada was born in 1896, died in 1977. He brought this Hare Krishna movement uh, to the United States. He came in 1965 and started the society. And he attracted thousands of disciples. And uh, I, I would imagine tens of thousands of followers like this. So so for me, it was, it was uh, you know, I had some negative experiences in my life and they are promising eternal happiness and bliss that satchitananda eternality happiness and bliss and i said well let me try this let me try this and so i i skipped school for the rest of the semester from august to december and i figured oh, let me try this if 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 i don't like it i'll just resume my studies in january and as it turned out i had a conversion experience and uh, spent a, a, a major part of my life there. Do you hear that, my Christian friends? He had a real conversion experience. <laughs> okay, so this this was obviously transformative, different. It, it satisfied you in some sense with what you were looking for in life at the moment, or at least it steered you in a direction to give you what they were wanting you to look for. But my, my question is, the leadership that was in this cult. Can you tell us about the cult and take us through this journey of these 12 to 15 years that you were in? Well, that's uh, a lot to say. Uh, I'll go back to uh, uh, Swami Prabhupada, who was the founder. He was, uh, he was a, a Gaudiya Vaishnav guru. Gaudiya Vaishnavism is, is actually the, the religion. And it has a, a fairly long history in India. And uh, he was instructed to bring, by his spiritual master, he, he was instructed to bring, uh, to preach in the West. And which he did. And he came at a time uh, during the heyday of the counterculture in New York City and San Francisco. And, and many teenagers and, and young adults were really questioning their 
the establishment and the, the life in the mainstream, and they were looking for something exotic. And uh, many, many of these uh, counterculture members and hippies gra uh, gravitated to, to the Hare Krishna movement. Okay, so so then one of Prabhupada's first disciples uh, was uh, Kirtanananda Swami, and later known as Kirtanananda Swami Bhaktipad. And that was my guru, all right? He was, I, I joined after Swami Prabhupada had passed away. So mm -hmm. he, was, he was my guru. And he was uh, uh, basically established this West Virginia farm community in uh, Marshall County, West Virginia. And uh, when I first met him, I saw him as a, uh, a very wise and uh, kind father figure. And that, that's a, another reason why I, I became a Hare Krishna devotee. Uh, and I did not realize it for decades. But as a child, and I had a, some emotional void, my relationship with my, my own father. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a great guy. It's just that we were so different. He, he loved gardening and, and building things with his hands. And when, he, when it was, he wanted me to go and weed in the garden, I'd like run and hide, you know. So, but I was interested in music and reading and things. And, and it, it just seemed that he wasn't able to be the father that I needed at the time, you know, it's mm -hmm. just personality thing. So, so I meet the Swami Bhaktipad. He's about 19 years older than me. And he appears very wise and magnanimous. And he took some interest in me. And uh, I just, uh, uh, over time, uh, accepted him as as a father figure, and uh, so anyway, that's that that's a digression there. But but it's important for me to you know understand uh, how I how I joined this. It wasn't it wasn't there was a lot of hidden motives and, and reasons and things like that. But anyway, the the, the Christian community it's all about preaching. Uh, you want to save people's souls. By uh, by encouraging them to chant Hare Krishna, to adopt this uh, you know vegetarian lifestyle, and uh, the the holy name of Krishna is uh, allegedly uh, uh, saves one from the cycle of birth and death, and uh, you can you can transcend the reincarnation, the transmigration of souls, and uh, hopefully. Uh, return to, to Krishna's personal abode. Of course, it, you know, that's that's the mythology of the religion, I right. would say, you know. and But but it's something that I kind of like adopted, uh, at least at least for that time. And and there are, I mean, I, I since then, I have discovered that uh, there are a lot of benefits to having religious beliefs which which can't be proven mm -hmm. you know empirically uh and it was a a, a time of a of, of happiness in in some ways you know but, I, but to be frank i think i'm a lot happier now since i left right let me ask you this as far as the experience goes and then we'll backtrack back onto the history of what happens um would you say that they just like a charismatic let's say Pentecostal or some type of Christian group that has you believe all of the theology and different things they want you to believe, they have ecstatic experiences that are attached to it, which make those beliefs more plausible in the mind of the, the adherent. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I had ecstatic experiences, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure many did. Uh, I have uh, friends who, uh, Kirtan is, is the congregational chanting of the holy names. Uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare are uh, three, three names of God. And it's, it's in, the, in the Hare Krishna tradition, the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, you, you, you chant them uh, quietly on beads, but you also gather together with drums and cymbals and dancing and 
and it's mm -hmm. a, a call and response and an antiphonal chant the, the leader will will sing the mantra and then we all follow and the the, the chanting and dancing can get quite ecstatic at times mm -hmm. and uh, yeah there's a type of ecstasy there uh i don't think i ever had an out-of-body experience but 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 there is uh the, you know there is enjoyment in that so you wrote a book just to remind everybody the book is killing for Krishna. So I guess getting into the history leading up to, you know, your experience through this cult, tell us, um, you know, s some of that history. And then what, why'd you write this book? Well, all right. I'll, I'm going to, I'll, I'll talk about the why first. Uh, as I said before, I was a, de a devout member fairly devout for uh, for some 15 years and during that time there were a couple murders of uh one one at the community uh and and another murder of a former community member which which occurred in los angeles and uh, uh i i mean i didn't know either of the people very well and i wasn't you know terribly involved uh, at all actually with them so that that was something i was aware of but it, it passed away so so years later after i left i think it was in 2001 or 2002 this is about seven eight years after after i moved away i was visiting the new vrindavan community uh and i have friends there still uh and i at the time i lived in pittsburgh pennsylvania i'd go several times a year for festivals and i'd see my old friends and anyway at one one visit uh this fella from toronto his name was such a such a he played viola he was very good violist and for like six eight years i was music director at the community i played the pipe organ we had an accordion orchestra we had a temple orchestra i wrote composed music for the services uh uh and he played viola in our orchestra and during this short conversation he he, he began reminding me of stuff we had done together music we had performed and that that i had forgotten in the in the past 12 years all right since we did these did, did this music and uh i real and, and i thought the music that that we did was i liked it i liked it a lot and i didn't i thought this see how memory f fades after time i decided i was going to write an article about the music that we did so that it, that it wouldn't be lost to poster posterity so i i had a a, a fairly uh, substantial collection of new vrindavan publications and and I looked through about the music and I got the dates and this and that. And I started writing. And then I realized, well, at this time in New Vrindavan history, we were, I was writing Western classical style music. But the Hare Krishnas, it's all traditional Bengali uh, folk music. All right. And I had to explain what went before and then why that music at New Vrindavan died that I had created and, and, and that was a long, long, long story. So it turned into a, a history of the New Vrindavan uh, community. And uh, I'd been working on it part-time, of course, because I have to earn a living. And uh, about in 20, 2016 or something, I, I was researching about this murder that of a former New Vrindavan resident. His name was Steve Bryant. In Krishna terms, he was called Sulochan. And I, I, one of my friends at New Vrindavan found out I was writing this history and he said, Rishikesh, come with me. That was my initiated name, Rishikesh. It means servant of the master of the senses, servant of God. And he took me up to this trailer this old dilapidated leaking uh trailer uh attract a, a truck trailer sitting in this abandoned parking lot amid this debris he unlocked the the gate we climbed inside and there happened to be 
the personal archives of my spiritual master, Kirtanananda Swami Bhaktipad. Hundreds and hundreds of his personal correspondence. There was Nubrandavan publications, ISKCON publications, letters, uh, tape, magnetic tape, a uh, slew of photographs, and he gave it to me. He said, you'll need this for your research. So little did he know what was in there. There were several boxes of papers that were actually classified information that nobody knew about. And, and, and one of the boxes was this whole, it told the whole story about the murder of this fellow Solochan and what, what had been going down. And then I discovered that all these high ranking leaders at New Vrindavan were involved in this murder conspiracy, including today, <laughs> one particular ISKCON guru who's got like tens and tens of thousands of disciples uh, and, no, and, and nobody knew that all these guys were involved because they're keeping it a secret. And, and uh, when, when I, you know, when I f found out the inside story about this murder conspiracy, which started in West Virginia, and Cleveland, Ohio, and they followed him out, hunted him for six months, finally shot the guy uh, twice in the, in the brains, in the head, in Los Angeles. Uh, I said, this book has to come out first, because I've already got a, a huge, enormous manuscript, thousands of pages, but this book has to come out first, because I think it's very important that, that at least the Krishna devotees know who was involved in this in this murder conspiracy so after killing for krishna came out in 2018 uh, uh two years later was 11 naked emperors which is a broader history of the takeover of iskan after swami Prabhupada died and then the volumes of gold guns and god which be, which deals specifically with kirtananda swami bhaktipad and the west virginia new Vrindavan community can you uh, tease us with some highlights that you think are relevant to this murder? Uh, it's multiple murders, you said, two murders. But specifically, you, you, one of them for sure, you're saying the top dogs were involved and you had writings from your spiritual master who is pretty much confessing, saying this is what they're doing. Was he involved in it too? Well, his, his writings... Don't don't uh, he he doesn't confess that he's in there. In fact, he went he went on trial for these murders, and the, and the jury uh, acquitted him of the murder charges because they didn't have enough evidence. But uh, going going back to this uh, question, uh, I, I mean, what year is this, by the way? Just just so we're is seventies sixties. Yeah, so Lochan was he was killed in. 1986. Okay. Uh, so if you want a brief summary of that, I, I can do that. Uh, oh, man, I don't know how, how brief it could be. But let's just say that this fellow Solochan, he lived at New Vrindavan uh, with his wife in, uh, from about 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, or on and off. They traveled a bit, but... But they were, during that time, they, they were living at New Vrindavan. And uh, the guy was, he, he, was kind, he was kind of abusive to his wife. I mean, in the, in the Hindu relationship, the wife is regarded as a servant. In fact, for thousands of years, women had no rights at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only in India, but in the West like that, you know. Right. Uh, women and children. So uh, the, the, the tradition uh, which Prabhupada espoused was that the wife has to serve the husband obediently, even if the husband is abusive. All right. And uh, uh, in this way, Prabhupada said, but if the wife is always obedient and submissive, she can capture the heart of her husband. Of course, that doesn't always happen. Mm -mm. You, know, you know, like this. So, so, so she lost whatever affection she had for him, and she was very dedicated to her spiritual master, which was uh, my spiritual master, 
Kirtan Ananda Swami Bhakti Pad. Salochan, however, he was uh, he was one of the uh, he was an original disciple of Swami Prabhupada. So uh, uh, he uh, got in, uh, I, I guess, some trouble with New Vrindavan leaders just because he wasn't. He wasn't submissive to the authorities. He he liked to argue, and uh, he got into a fight one time during a basketball game, and uh, he got essentially got beat up. So then he said, "I'm leaving now. Uh, I'm moving away. This is this community is no good, not a good place from either for my wife or two children." And he ordered his wife to join him in exile. She refused. Because because she loved Swami Bhaktipad like a, a daughter loves a father, and she loved she loved living at New Vrindavan. A lot of people did, mm -hmm. all right, you know. But in order to 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 love living there, you have to be a submissive disciple of the Guru. And Salochan was not that at all. He wasn't even a disciple of Bhaktipad. He was a god brother. So so he takes their two kids, uh, and uh, you know begs her to join him and she refuses so then he 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 takes off meanwhile she goes to swami bhaktipad and says you know my husband took took my two kids can we get them back so bhaktipad calls up uh three of three enforcers uh it, it, we call them chatriyas chatriya is one of the uh four varnas uh, uh of the caste system chatriya means a warrior uh a ruler kind of like that you know a fighter so, so he got three guys. They got in the van with with the mother, and started following this guy. They knew where he was going. He's going to his parents' house in Michigan, and they're passing this grocery store on Route Seven in Ohio, and they see his van in the parking lot. He had stopped because one of his his kids needed diapers. All right, he had to change the kid. So he went into the store, they come in, they retrieve the two kids, and the, the kids are sitting on their mother's lap in the community van. He comes out of the grocery store and and he wants his kids kids back, but the three guys have, have pistols and rifles, all right, the three chatriyas. And, and, and their point is, if I were you, I would just get in your van and drive away. So he was outgunned, you know, he, he had to surrender like that. So mm -hmm. after that, he uh, developed a real hatred of Swami Bhaktipad because he felt his wife loved Bhaktipad more than she loved him. She didn't love him at all, actually. You know, they weren't a good match, but, uh, and, he, and he, was, he was abusive to her. So he goes to Los Angeles and uh, uh, eventually Los Angeles. And while there, he bribes, a member of the BBT, that's the Bhakti Vedanta Book Trust. Prabhupada started a book publishing company to publish his books, and he's got like 49 books. Uh, mostly, hmm. mostly they're translations and commentary on Sanskrit and Bengali scripture. So he 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 bribes this uh, employee to to give him Swami Prabhupada's complete letters uh, on microfish. And he's reading through these letters and he discovers that Swami Prabhupada, who was the founder of the whole movement, he wrote like dozens of letters criticizing the Swami Bhaktipad, his disciple. And uh, then he talked to other people uh, who had lived at Nuvrindavan and they told him stories of child abuse, uh, illegal uh, uh, drug dealing to, to raise money to build Prabhupada's palace. And also uh, of criminal activities such as the murder, which took place in 1983, which I haven't really talked about. Right. So he started writing a book about all this crap going on at New Vrindavan. And uh, uh, to, to make it short, uh, you know, the, the, the Chatriyas at New Vrindavan, the, the warrior class, and some of the Brahmins, the, 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 the sannyasi, they decided this guy should be should be killed and they justified this because he was blaspheming the saintly spiritual master and in the vedic scriptures 
uh, several places. It said that a blasphemer should be killed uh, with no punishment awarded to the executioner. See, so they were like going back in this ancient mythology, you know, it's like, you know, it, it's, they don't realize that they're living in a whole new society now, you know, but, right. but that was the thing to, to reestablish this ancient, ancient culture. That was one of the things. And they eventually, you know, caught up to, to the guy and killed him. So it's like it's like saying stone your kids to death because you found it in the Hebrew Bible, but Christians don't do that. Uh, you know, it, 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 you could try, you know, to say, well, that's in our text, but that's an interesting thing. They're trying to found the ancient in modern time. And um, you mentioned 1983, a murder that it seems like he caught wind of in these writings. He caught wind that they knew about a murder. And this could easily have been something that could have been given to the FBI or given to some type of services that could have been involved to take the whole thing down. What, what was this 1983 thing? If you don't mind me asking. And um, yeah, I, I just, if you don't mind, fill us in uh, on the story. Cause this is a very interesting story. I expect that you go into detail in your books that really cover a lot of the detail that we don't, we don't hear today. Yeah, of course. I mean, Killing for Krishna is 600 pages, you know, so it's a lot of detail. <laughs> but, but in 1983, this uh, one New Vrindavan resident, his name was Chakradari or Charles St. Dennis. He was he was murdered. Uh, and I mean, that's a that's a story in itself. You know, the, the things that lead it. He was murdered by uh, New Vrindavan's chief enforcer. His name was Tirta, Thomas Drescher. And I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this happened, but probably the the most, the biggest reason is that this fellow Chakradari uh, had this confrontation with the guru Swami Bhaktipad. He had heard that Bhaktipad had been attending parties uh, hosted by the uh, Mexican workers you see new Vrindavan at that time they 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 drove vans into mexico and recruited cheap labor you know and brought them illegally into the country and they'd give them a, an abandoned house to live in and they would the, the guys would make more money you know at, at new Vrindavan than they would in mexico so they could send money back to their families and stuff but they but they would have parties and at the parties there'd be alcohol maybe cocaine uh, marijuana and stuff uh, but see those intoxicating pleasures are off limits to Krishna devotees that when you're initiated you take a vow you can't even drink coffee or tea because there's stimulants in them hmm. so anyway he had heard from a, a reliable source that Bhattipat had attended some of these parties with, and, and there were a good number of homosexual uh, young men among the Mexican workers because they were recruited by Kirtanananda's former lover in college, who also was homosexual, and he liked dark-skinned young men. So anyway, so Chakradari, who was, who was murdered in 83, he had a confrontation about, about this, because the, the Swami's not supposed to be doing this kind of stuff. And I, at the time, I had also heard something, but I just attributed it uh, as a rumor. I assumed it was... Uh, just a rumor and in fact my whole time there you you hear rumors but uh, uh, with unless there's some proven facts you know I, I, with most of us just just but Chakradari he confronted him so uh, there was an opportunity uh, for one fella hated this guy and he, he wanted to kill him because his wife told him uh, he had he had raped her which is probably not true either so anyway, so so Bhaktipad asked his chief enforcer to get with this guy, and and do it do a good job, make sure the you know one ever finds the body. And uh, yeah, so these these two guys, Tirta and and his accomplice, they 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 uh, they they shot him like they, they used up the whole gun on the guy. And Chakradar is a big guy. He's a strong guy, you know, and he kept coming, coming at them. He, he, he had, so they had to use like 
a hammer to smash his head, screwdrivers. Oh, my God, it was like really, really, really bad. And this is all in the trial testimony. You know, so so they they uh, so finally, you know, he's he's dead and, and they put put his body in the Jeep and they had already dug a grave for him. They built a dam on this creek on New Brindavan property and uh, and dug a hole. So they're going to bury the body under the creek. That way, dogs couldn't couldn't sniff it, you know, couldn't find out, or, or an animal wouldn't dig it up. And as as they're dragging him into the, and putting him in the hole, he he op- he opens his eyes and says, uh, he says, wait wait, don't do that, you'll kill me or something like that. He was still dead, so they just like covered covered him with dirt. He was still breathing, you know, and then. I mean, it was horrible, horrible, uh, horrible incidency. So, and the police knew about this. They, I mean, they knew that he had disappeared, and they suspected it was a murder, but nobody had any details. So it wasn't for three years uh, when the FBI got involved after this murder in Los Angeles of Solochan that they were able to put the whole piece together, and they got people to talk to talk about it, you know, so, and th- I call this, I call this deranged devotion. In fact, the subtitle of Killing for Krishna is the danger, <laughs> the danger of deranged devotion. And it's like, wow, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, believe anything you want, you know, and do anything you want uh, and do it for Krishna and the spiritual master. So, so this is Kirtanananda had his power over these people, a charismatic relation, because of the mythology of that he he himself had created with his followers oh this is so complex and there's so many layers yeah oh my god it's like yeah that's why it's 10 volumes to to write the the gold guns and god series because there's so much going on over you know 30 years of history as far as the murder did they get people who were there actively murdering to speak about this they that were people that actually killed the guy that talked or was it people that were how did they find out these details all right a few things a few things one is uh okay the 1983 murder at new Vrindavan property uh when uh in, in 86 Tirta, who was the chief enforcer, he was arrested. Uh, and he was charged with the murder of, of uh, Chakradari in 1983. Although they, did, they had no body. But his accomplice, all right, his accomplice agreed to talk uh, in return for a plea bargain. I think he got five years in prison and then uh, a federal witness protection program uh, name change and he and his family moved to another state that's what we think because with no one's no one's in the krishna movement has seen the guy since he got out of prison you know so so he did speak about the 1983 murder and that's where we get all these details about uh, that i just described that they emptied the gun in him and used a hammer to hit his head you know, so he he spoke about it. He was he was there. He was an accomplice in, in in this murder. And as far as the murder of of Solochan in Los Angeles in uh, in 1986, uh, Tirta had an accomplice also there. Uh, his name was Krishna Kata or Jeffrey Briars, and uh, the police uh, got him to talk. Now Tirta, he was the original. He was the chief enforcer. Who, who who did both of the murders, he refused to talk, of course, because he's a dedicated disciple of Swami Bhaktipat. He's going to protect his spiritual master, even if he has to go uh, to life in prison or the death, death chamber like that, and he did. However, in 1993, Bhaktipat was caught in bed with one of his teenage uh, male disciples. And this news kind of spread around. Of course, half the people thought it was a rumor. 
I believed it because I knew the fellow who saw it and I trusted him. So at this point, Tyr to in prison now, who's serving a life term in prison, he realizes that he was just duped, you know, thinking that his spiritual master was this great saintly person. And the and and the master, you know, I mean he heard rumors. Most of us all you know, heard rumors that he's messing around with boys or young men, but we thought there were now he believes it to be fact. So then then he did go and testified and he said yes, Bhaktipad, uh authorized the murder of Chakradari and, and Salochan like that. So, I mean, it's a uh, very sad, very sad chapter. His, his, in fact, probably the worst chapter of the whole history of the uh, the Hare Krishna movement. It's been been around for 50 years almost. The chaos, drugs, sex, scandal, everything under the sun for a Game of Thrones episode, you know? Uh, this 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 would make for a heck of a series if this was on uh, Netflix or something. Let me ask you this. The, the, the guy who's the spiritual master, isn't that also who was your spiritual master? Yes. Kirtanananda Swami Bhaktipad, he was my spiritual master. Tirta, who was the chief enforcer, he and I are god brothers. And uh, for a time around the 2000s, I did correspond with him in prison. We, we shared about uh, 200 letters between us. Wow. And uh, uh, because I was, you know, doing research and, and he needed a friend too. Uh, I mean, he, he's got few friends. Yeah. A few people write to him. Uh, hardly anyone ever visits him. And... Uh, but uh, but after my book Killing for Krishna came out, he, uh, he I haven't heard a word from him, you know, because it's an honest book, you know, and he's he and he all this time he's been still covering for some of the conspirators. So he still buys into the mythology somewhat. So even finding out his spiritual masters, you know, full of it, the whole religion itself, the, the mythology itself, still had a hold on him. You think? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, there is uh, when when I first uh, came to New Vrindavan and I, you know, began st studying uh, and hearing about the uh, they they call it the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. You know, it was a, it, a kind of a eye opening experience to me because if you see the world through this lens. It explains lots of things like karma, for instance. You know, if you do good in the future, you're going to get a reward. Or if you do bad, you're going to get a result. So, right. you know, it, it, like you think, why are some children, you know, born with a silver spoon and others are, uh, you know, suffer greatly? You know, it's like, well, it's because of their past lives like this, you know. So, so I mean, of course, none of this can be ever proven. It's, it's a belief system, mm -hmm. you know. But but nonetheless, there there can be some satisfaction in that. I'm sure many Christians uh, also have a satisfaction in their belief that Christ died. For right. Me, or know. my grandma just died, and I will see her again. Right. You know. Yeah. Even you know. if you are making it up, even if it is fictive in your own mind, there is satisfaction and a relief of the grief. Of thinking this isn't the end this isn't goodbye this is just see you later and there's a sense of uh satisfaction that comes from that myth but as far as it being a fact that's a whole nother question of what is reality and this leads me up to this point in this interview i i hope we can have more because there is so much i know for a fact that we could discuss diving into your book series and discussing these matters is i want to talk to you the man and ask you, where do you stand now after all you witnessed? Where are you at today in your thinking on all of the spiritual and the mythology and the cult? And has it changed your perspective now examining the history and looking at these are just men. These are just people who where are you at today? Tell us your personal position, if you don't mind. Right now. Right now, yeah, yeah, for sure. Up, you know, what happened to, to change your mind, and, and where are you at today? Well, let's let's let, let me let me just back up just a little bit. Uh, okay, I was raised a Roman Catholic, 
but uh, I wasn't devout or anything uh, and never really thought about religion or Jesus like that. I went to Catholic schools too for 12 years, but uh, when, uh, when I went off to college in, uh, in Missouri, I lived, grew up in New Jersey, I moved out to uh, Missouri. Uh, basically, I think I went to mass twice and then I said, I don't need this, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, then uh, I, I, as I explained earlier, there was a time in, in my senior year in college where things were, I was realizing things aren't going the way I was hoping they'd be go uh, as far as finding a, a meaningful and really wonderful relationship uh, with a woman or even career wise, I was understanding my limitations and what I was not able to do musically. And uh, so then I was kind of uncertain about my career and I was really ripe for joining, joining a cult with a charismatic leader like Kirtananda Swami. So uh, I came there and I, and I, and I test, uh, you know, tried out, tried out the uh, the belief system and the and the practice and uh i liked it uh you know pr pr pretty pretty well but then about 14 15 years later i began to have doubts uh, about uh, my spiritual master I, he was acting saying things that were pretty irrational and i wasn't i don't i don't know why i wasn't like the fanatical cult member that, you know, whatever the guru says, you just bow down and say, yes, master, you know, whatever, even if it sounds like crazy. Uh, in fact, in fact, when Donald Trump first began campaigning for the uh, nomination back in whenever it was, 2015 or something, I said, oh, my God, this guy's just like my spiritual master, Bhaktipad. He, <laughs> he can say or do any damn thing. And the people bow down and worship him, you know, yay, you know, like, yeah, it was like, you know, I mean, he'd say, he'd say like, you know, of course, we all know the, the fact checking on Trump, I think it's like 25,000 things he said that were like falsehoods and stuff like this. But, but, but Kirtananda was, was the same way. And, and somehow after, after 15 years, I had, I had, uh, begun to have some doubts in uh, in him. And then when that Winnebago incident came, when he was, when one of my God brothers observed him in, in bed with his young Malaysian disciple, uh, I pretty much severed, severed my uh, attachment to him. Of course, it takes a little while to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it. an immediate thing, but, but, but it was fairly, fairly quickly. In fact, uh, uh, after I had I had met with him in private after I did some research myself, you know, uh, uh, and talked to some of these these boys uh, who were now by that time young men, and uh, I I basically challenged him. I said I said uh, uh, you know this is what what they say is is true or not, and he denied everything, and I knew he was lying because I'd done my own research. So that's basically when I rejected him. But I didn't reject Krishna consciousness, you know. I, even after I moved to Pittsburgh, I would still chant on the beads, and and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, I was mostly vegetarian. Well, I was still, you know. But but as time as time went on, and I discovered more and more of, about the nature of cult mentality, about the nature of the charismatic relationship between the uh, the, the guru and the disciple. And seeing all the psychological factors that uh, that, and also seeing so many contradictions uh, spoken even by the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, you know, I said, this guy's not an infallible, perfect being, you know, uh, all knowing, as as so many people, you know, still believe, and. Uh, as far as karma and reincarnation, you know, this, so, so there was a, a gradual transformation myself. I became a, a, an advocate of the scientific method. Mm -hmm. In other words, Same. I'm not going to believe anything unless there's really good evidence for this. Right. 
You know, evidence is so, so important. And uh, so, you know, I mean, there's no evidence for karma. You know, it's really chance, you know. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, reincarnation is just a belief, you know, it can never can never be never be proven. Uh, uh, at least to date, and uh, so I, you know, I'm not a Hare Krishna devotee uh, uh, anymore. However, I, I do have friends who still are, and I can relate to them. Mm -hmm. And some of them can relate to me. Not not everyone can, but uh, uh, but I, but I, I believe uh, all the stuff which is unproven is really myth. And it's okay. It's I, I don't mind believing in a myth, but 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 speaking for myself, and it was very interesting. The, the Krishnas talk about liberation, all right, and that is uh, transcending the uh, the material world. Uh, li liberation is like an eye-opening experience, enlightenment, perhaps. And uh, it was interesting because once I. Uh, began to only believe uh, things which had strong evidence. Mm -hmm. That was an enlightening experience for me. Yep, it was like liberation. I'm, I'm no, and I have friends who, who, you know, uh, uh, are still involved with the Krishnas, and some of them drink alcohol from time to time, and and and. Uh, 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 they it gives them like terrible guilt, you know, uh, and and it's to to me that's that's like bondage. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I mean, yeah, of course, if, if you become addicted, all right, that's not a good thing at all, you know. But but to feel terrible guilt, uh, you know, uh, if you uh, or look look at. Uh, pass a woman on the street or something and you get aroused or something like that that's something else which is sinful right you know and 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 for, for me it's it's not a it's not a big deal you know it, it doesn't it's make, normal <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't make me it, it doesn't give me terrible guilt you right. know like, you know and I'm not sure I ever had terrible guilt, even with the Krishnas, because some things I didn't even. I mean, I was pretty devout, but there were there were some things I I never believed, like like Prabhupada, he says that that the moon landing was a hoax, because in in the scriptures, the Hindu scriptures, uh, supposedly, the moon is further from the earth than the sun. See, right? I mean, it's it's a uh, what is it called? A uh, not heliocentric Earth, the Earth-centric, geocentric universe. I think you know, and and they believe this to be fact. You know, all the the cosmology, which was written thousands of years ago. You know, before the invention of telescopes and stuff, and and they still believe that. I I never I never believed that, but it wasn't important for for my life. You know, at New Madhav. and so I could deal deal with that cognitive dissonance. I think it's called. Wow, there's so much here. I'm I'm with you on the scientific method and feeling a freedom and kind of realizing, hold on, what are we? Why are we experiencing these things, and why are we creating this this guilt over a myth or mythology in our head when we should have at best a mythology that fits to the reality of what seems to be sensible in the world around us rather than, you know, I looked and I felt it in my heart toward a girl or, something. you know, come on, get out of here. That's, that's overboard. So, um, I really do appreciate you coming on today. Let's continue this discussion. I want the audience watching this to let us know what you think in the comment section. We have never embarked this topic on myth vision thus far. And this is our first time you have Many books. I hope everybody will go and check those out. Where should we start? Well, if, if you're interested in my books, just go to Amazon and go to my author page because there's. I'm seven. saying which book though? Which book? I have it oh. visible in front of everybody right now. They can all see your books right now. Which one should they start with, and in what order should they work? Well, I would suggest uh, 
starting with Killing for Krishna. Okay. That, was that first one published. And, and that's that's about the murder of Solochan in Los Angeles in 1986. Eleven Naked Emperors was the second book. And that deals with the Hare Krishna movement as a whole, how 11 senior disciples took over uh, after the passing of the founder, uh, Swami Prabhupada. And if you're still interested after those two, then you could start the Gold Guns and Gods, one, two, three, four, five. Wow. And then, by the way, I'm working on six right now. It's a 10 volume, a proposed 10 volume series. This is amazing. I hope everybody goes down, get you a copy of Kill Him for Krishna. Let us know what you think about this. I'm excited. I, I really am. And uh, follow him on Amazon so when new stuff comes out, you know it. Thank you so much, Henry. I really do appreciate your time. Is there any words of encouragement you would leave for someone who's in a cult? And it, it your story is so relatable. I don't care what kind of cult it is. It's like this common trope of everyone who goes through cults. What words of encouragement would you give to someone who's go, going through this experience right now and they're, they're coming out? Well, if, if you're if you're coming out, uh, just be brave, and 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 follow 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 your intelligence. Use your use your intelligence. Uh, you're going to have emotional uh, withdrawal symptoms. In fact, in fact, some of my friends who who I didn't re never met until after the books came out, they read the books and they wrote to me and stuff. One of them has not been with the Krishnas for 20 years, and he was still seeing a psychologist like every week about the uh, the trauma he experienced and trying to overcome that. After he read Killing for Krishna, he said he, he's only got to go see the psychologist once a month or every other month now because it is such a healing healing process for him. So so just just be brave, do what you got to do, guys, and. Uh, and uh, I think everything in, in, in the long run will, will, will turn out much for the better. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, hit the like button. Don't forget to get a copy of his book. Join Mythician's Patreon because Patreon members are seeing this first. And never forget, we are Mythicians.